We're starting a brand new series, um, and uh, I want to go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, as we begin uh, this sermon series through the month of December all the way uh, up until Christmas Eve. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, magi, or wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. I want you, I want you to see this. Here's wise men that are coming to find the king. They're coming to find the king. They didn't come to find a baby. They didn't come to find a story. They didn't come to find some rumor. They came to find the king. And it says the reason that they came to find him was so that they could worship. The purpose of them finding Jesus was not to get something for themselves, but in fact to actually give something of themselves to him. Now this is going to date me a little bit, but my grandma growing up, uh, she would get a catalog. Anybody remember catalogs? From Sears. Come on, anybody remember the Sears catalog? And the holiday edition had a wish list. And oh man, I love the wish list. And the, some of you younger people are like, what is a catalog? It's like a paper Amazon. Okay? Okay, it's, it's, real, it's real similar. Some of us older people know how it goes. And so, we, man, we would go through that catalog. We'd mark everything that we wanted. And so for us, it was more than a wish list because if we marked it for grandma, it was more than a wish. It was like a guarantee. And so grandma makes sure that whatever's on the wish list, we were going to get. And uh, so we would fill that thing out, and, and, um, and, and, and we would make our wish of what we were going to get. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Toys have changed over the years. And, and um, I don't know if you got kids and your house gets full of toys. Um, but I, I, I found that I was tricked by our culture um, into buying toys that I didn't need. And, and, and I found out the secret is not more toys. The secret is an iPad. <laughs> now, I know some of your parents are like, we're an anti-technology family. That's totally fine. That's totally fine. Keep on buying all the toys that your kids are watching someone else open on YouTube. <laughs> See, that's, that's what happened is my kids were watching another kid open presents. And then they said that they wanted what he had. And then I would buy them what he had, but they didn't want to play with what I got. They would just watch him open the new thing, and it's, it's a scam. <laughs> because I kept on buying things, but they never wanted. They wanted to watch him. Oh, I, can't, I mean, it's like you're supposed to love everybody, but I can't stand that kid. I know he's all rich and everything in the house, and he's fine, all right? But it's like, come on. And, and my, oh, I want that. No, you don't. You want to watch him open it. His presence changed now. Get, get, get your kid an iPad. Let him watch someone else play with the toy. That's all they need these days. Wish list. You know what? I was praying about the series and just thinking about uh, us as we approach God. And I think for some of us, the way that we approach God is exactly that. It's he's our, he's our wish list God. We come and we have our order of things that we want from him. And we need the miracles and we have the needs and we want our life and we're wishing for hope and we're wishing for peace and we're wishing for legacy and we're wishing for comfort, we're wishing for a spouse, we're wishing for kids. We have all of these things that we're, we're hoping for, wishing for. And for most of us, our theology around God is if we do enough for him, if we pray enough, if we're holy enough, if we're right enough, if we come to church enough, then, then we're going to get what we're wishing for. But I want to try to pull apart the theology maybe that some of us have connected with because God is not a vending machine that you put in your dedication, you get to pull the lever, and you get your wish list. God is not some made-to-order package for me and for you. In fact, God was not created for us. We were created, do you know this? God was not created, some of you are like, wait, what? No, God's not created for you. We were created for God. That's why the wise men in verse 2, it says they're going to find the king, and they were going to worship him. They were not trying to get something from Jesus. They were not coming with their wish list of things that they wanted God to do for them. They came to Jesus with gifts. They came with worship. 
Now, I know when you talk about worship, everyone has an idea in their mind of like what worship is. And I think sometimes to know what worship is or anything is, you have to know what it's not. Can I help you with something? Worship is not a song. Worship is, some of you are like, man, I couldn't worship today. They didn't say my song. No, worship, worship is not a song. If worship is relegated to a song, your worship is too shallow. Worship is not a song. Worship is not a style. Man, these young kids, they don't just worship like we used to. It's not a style, friend. You can have your style. You can like or not like, but it's not worship or not worship. Worship is deeper than style. Worship is not a service. This is not the only place that worship happens. Worship can happen in your home. Worship can happen in your car. Worship can happen at a sporting event. And all the Baylor Bear fans said, yeah, Donna's been praising all weekend. Worship can happen anywhere. Worship's not a service. Worship is not a show. We don't come to church, watch the band, do what they do, and, and, and spectate on what. And say, oh, we went to worship today. We worship, can I just say it this way? Worship simply is attention. Worship is what wins the battle of your focus. It wins the battle of priority. It wins the battle of your attention. Worship is about what has your attention. The wise men, when they were coming and they were looking for Jesus, Jesus had their attention. He had their attention. And their chief goal in finding him was to give him something. Their purpose in finding him wasn't to get what they wanted, but to give what they had. Can, can, you, can you even imagine this if we came to God with this mentality? God, we came to church today, and we didn't come to get what you have for us. We came to give you what we have. I mean, it's just like, it's so, so, some of you are about ready to leave already. It's like, wait, I came for something. Did you know that the way we were created was actually to give worship to God. The wise men had it right. They were, they were wise. They came to give. They did not come to receive. It says they were looking for the king. I'm going to tell you this. Whoever is the king in your life is probably what has the worship of your life. If Jesus is the king of your life, he probably has the worship of your life. But if your job, your schedule, your success, your money, your popularity, your progress, your influence is king over your life, it probably has your worship too. Well, no, I, I worship God, but I need to give myself. No, you worship what you give your attention to. I, I found this to be true about worship. Worship, and I'll explain this, worship is obvious. It's, it's ob worship is obvious when I see him rightly. If you see Jesus rightly, worship is automatic. If I see him for who he is, it is automatic. If you see him as a vending machine, you won't worship him. If you see him as a God that can give you what you need when no one else will, and I just got to beg him, and I got to perform, and I have to perform these religious duties, and I'm legalistic, it's not that. Worship is obvious. What, this is what worship that's obvious means. When you see him rightly, worship is your automatic Response. Amen. Right. Oh God, you are so am worship is automatic. You're so amazing. You're worthy. You're God. You're King of all. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and for when I begin to see Him, you're good. Your love endures. For when I see Him for who He is, my worship is automatic. Jesus, when He would teach, He would teach oftentimes in stories. One of the best storytellers of all time. And they're called, in your Bible, they're called parables. So Jesus would speak in these parables. One of the parables is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And it says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Ch check this out. When they saw the treasure that was in the field, it says he took everything he had, not some of it, not part of it, not what he felt God was worth, not what he felt the field might appraise at. He said he took everything. And there's this little key phrase in there, and it says, and with joy. He, whatever happened to the joy of believers? Whatever happened to the joy of worship, the joy of serving God? 
I hear all the time about the complaints of serving God and how hard it is and how God didn't answer or didn't work in the way. Because we come to God like he's a wish list. And we give him these ideas that we think he should abide by. Can I help you out? God is not moved or managed by what we want him to do. God is God all by himself. He's God outside of time and space. He's the same God that's been. He's the same God that will be. My Bible says that his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. That means that sometimes I'm not going to understand what he does or what it looks like he fails to do. But I, I, I trust him. I, I have a problem as a parent. I got two boys and... and um, I was so excited with my boys because I got like different milestones that I want to do different things with them. And my problem is I'm always about two years too soon. So when Genesis turned three, I'm like, oh man, Jamie, this is going to be incredible. I, I'm, I got him an electric scooter. She's like, can you even drive an electric scooter? I'm like, I think. I mean, like, can you not? I mean, he's three. He can walk. And, and, and so I tried to get him to ride the electric scooter. He's terrified of it. Now he... Three years later, he will not touch the electric switch. It's sitting in the garage. He won't touch it. Gave it to him too soon. You know, it's, it's part of a parent's responsibility to make sure that you don't give your kids too much responsibility or too much, too, too, too much of life too soon. That's a parent. Think about God. God knows things that we don't. He sees things that we don't. I can't tell you how many times in life I've wanted to just... Get frustrated with God and say, why didn't you? Or what, why didn't you do it in this timeline? Or why didn't you do it in this way? But friend, at some point, you've got to recognize the disconnect between me and God is vast. And God, you know something I don't know. You have my best interest in mind, even when I don't understand it, even when I can't see it. So my response is not to make a wish. My response is to come before you and worship. Because if I see you rightly, my worship is automatic. Once this man saw, recognized, noticed the treasure in the field, he sold, sold all he had so that he could buy it, and he sold it with joy. Can you imagine if people started like giving up their life with joy? Can you imagine if people started tithing with joy? Can you imagine paying your taxes next year with joy? Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. That's like supernatural. That's, that's. The Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver is not just talking about your money. It's talking about the way you give your life. Some of you were talking about our safety team that serves and gives. That's a giving. People that work with our kids and our children and make the, the campus work, they're giving up their time. And you know what? They do it with joy. They do it with joy because if you see his worth, your worship becomes automatic and you can do it with joy. Worship is obvious if you see him rightly, but worship is also costly. You ever found this to be true? Worship is, is costly. It, 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 it costs you something. Worship is not about feelings. It's about perspectives. You know, sometimes I don't feel like worshiping, but it doesn't mean he's worthy of any less worship. Because worship is not about me. Worship is about the worth of the one we're worshiping. So that never changes. So whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, it doesn't mean he gets good praise or good worship or bad worship. He's worthy of it outside of my scenario or circumstance. That's a tough, that's a tough reality. When you go through difficulty, when you go through life's ups and downs, it's pretty hard to understand that even though I'm hurting, he deserves, he deserves my worship. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29 it says, ascribe to the Lord the glory, what does it say? Do. That means he deserves it. That means he, it's owed him. That we've got to give to him the glory, the worship, do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let me just say this worship is about what you give, not what you receive. Worship. I, we, we say this in Christian circles. What'd you get out of worship today? Right? You ever heard this? What'd you get out of the service today? What, what'd you get out of the worship today? Nothing, except my ears are ringing. <laughs> what'd you get? <laughs> it's a long, long standing joke. <laughs> what, what'd you get? Maybe theologically the better question we should ask is, what did you, what'd you give? So what'd you give today? What'd you get? I gave everything and I gave it with joy. 
I gave him my whole heart. I gave him my whole life. I gave him my whole, this isn't popular. Man, this, this used to be popular preaching back in the day. Your grandfather and your grandmother, they used to love this type of preaching. This culture today, they don't like this type of preaching. This is, this is, this is not popular preaching. To say that God is worthy of my life and I should give him my future and my stuff and I should do it with joy. Yeah, but you know what? Maybe that's why this culture is missing out the joy, missing out on the joy of serving God is because we have come to God with the wrong perspective. We have come to him thinking that if I give him enough service, he'll give me what I want. No wonder we're disappointed in God. He's not the vending machine that you thought he was. He's actually God. He's actually worthy of our worship. He's actually worthy of our lives. Worship is about what you give and not what you receive. I, I remember that story about Jesus, and he's getting ready. This is like towards the end of his life, and he's getting ready to give his life for us, to be, to be crucified and to, we know to be raised from the dead. And uh, he's there in, in the house. Luke chapter 7 says the woman comes with an alabaster box. There's a jar or a box of perfume. And so uh, the Bible teaches us that the value was up to a year's wages. So whatever the median average household income for this area, you take that, it's in one box. All right? And, and, and she, when she saw Jesus, the Bible says she broke that box. Theologians believe that once the seal on the perfume was broken, it was now useless to the world. So what was once a year's salary is now zero. It's interesting. The box that was broken on Jesus became useless to the world, but became worship to him. She didn't give part way. She didn't give a partial offering, a partial gift, or partial life. She gave everything that she had. And she says, when that box was broken, the fragrance of the box filled the house. I'm going to tell you, this, there is something about brokenness. There is something about worship that emits a beautiful fragrance. I'm telling you, if our city needs something right now, it's the fragrance of broken believers. If our city needs something, if our nation needs something right now, it is not another activist. It's not another post. It's the beauty of Christians' lives laid down. It's the beauty of worship beginning to rise from their heart. It's the beauty of all in commitment and all in worship of a God that's worthy of it. It's costly. It's costly. The cost was of no concern to her when she saw him for who he was. Worship is costly, but also worship is healing. Worship is, I don't know if you know this, but, but worship is here. When you go through pain, when you go through crisis, it's one of the most pivotal moments in your faith. Because you have an opportunity whether to make a decision to worship or to make some wish that it was different than what it was. I'm going to tell you this. Some of the most defining moments in my life have been moments of loss where I can, I can clearly remember that I was in a place of brokenness, but I chose to worship. And those moments, I, I was recounting them to Jamie the other day. I'm like, think about this, think about this, think about this, think about this. And I can think back to moments I had with God that correlate with those moments of brokenness because of one decision, to not wish it was different, but to worship through it. Wow. T- it'll, it'll change your life. It'll heal your heart. Because you'll spend your whole life and you'll make yourself go crazy wishing something was different than what it was. Or you can just decide, God, I don't understand it. I can't see through it. It's broken my heart. But I'm going to worship my way through it. Worship is healing. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament about King David. And King David, I mean, you know, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. King David was a mess. He was a lot like us. And uh, I think I relate with King David because he's like emotional, like roller coaster. It's like one day it's like, God, where are you? And the next day it's like, you are my rock and my refuge. It's like, I got you. I get you, David. I, I get it. And, uh, and, and so David, he's, he's just like committed all kinds of sin with Bathsheba. And, and um, so he's got, he's got a son coming and, and, and sick. And the Bible, Bible says that David was seeking the Lord for his son to live. That he was fasting. That means not eating. He was praying. He wouldn't bathe, which I think that's a little extreme. You can, you can not eat and still take a bath. It, He was beside himself with grief, beseeching God, 
to change the situation that was, this is what your Bible teaches you. That God didn't change the situation. That his son died. This is crazy. I mean, I, I, I cannot even imagine that tension in your heart to pray and believe. Many of you have walked through this. Some of us in our body, we've even walked through loss recently, as recent as this week. And you're torn because you believe and you stand and you want God to. And then, and then it doesn't happen the way that you wanted it to. This is what the Bible says. David got up, took a bath, went to the house of God, and worshipped. I'm going to tell you this. This will change your entire life. Those, those three things will change. We'll add four in there because that will change someone else's life. Just make sure you take the bath. But he, <laughs> this, he, got, he got up. He got up. I can see somebody thinking, like, is take a bath one of the points? Like, <laughs> if you ask the question, then yes. <laughs> he got up. He went to the house of God. And he worshiped. I'm telling you, this is how you heal your heart. You get up. Oh, don't tell me to overcome my feelings. I'm not trying to tell you to neglect your feelings. I'm trying to tell you that your feelings don't have to be a death sentence on the rest of your life. I'm trying to tell you that we serve a God of freedom, that we serve a God that sets people free, that we serve a God that heals people's hearts. And worship, friend, will heal your heart like nothing else can. As soon as David saw God's not answering my prayer, he says, okay, my heart is still broken, but my trust is not shaken. Washed himself, got up. You know how many people never get up? They ne God, doesn't, God doesn't answer, and they think that they wish that it would have been different, and they give up on God. I wish it would have been different. I wish they would have responded different. I wish they wouldn't have said that. I wish, and, they, and, and they never get up. David, he exemplifies something different. The Bible says he got up. He went to the house of God. You know how hard it is sometimes to just come to church when your heart's broken? Sometimes it's difficult. But I don't think we give each other enough credit sometimes for just showing up. Just coming and sitting in the seats and, and getting online and just participating in what God's doing. Because sometimes when you're really hurting, the last thing you want to do is shake someone's hand and say, be blessed, brother. When you're hurting, the last thing you want to do is come serve in some ministry. David knew how to get healing. He says he got up. He went to the house of God. And he worshipped. You might ask the question, what was he worshipping God for? See, that's where our theology has been so skewed. He wasn't worshipping God for something. He was worshipping God because God's intrinsic value did not change because the situation did. God is still the same, and he's still worthy of our worship. Worship isn't something that we do and we receive what we've wished for. Worship is the proper, proper response to seeing his worth. It's the proper response. Romans chapter 12. If, you, if you've listened to my preaching for very long, you've heard me talk about Romans chapter 12. I love this passage of scripture. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, let me put it up there on the screens. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, to give your attention, to give your foot, to worship. As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Oh, this is your true and proper worship. Worship's not a song, not a service, not a style, not a show. What is worship? Worship is me as a living sacrifice. Yes. Some of you are like, whoa, where are we going here? I didn't say debt sacrifice. I mean, at least it's better. I mean, I didn't write it. Commit, give your body as a living sacrifice. This is your true and proper. I don't know why this got me, but I just thought it was funny that they said proper. Because I would like to say, like, this is my, audash, my audacious act of love. Right? And he said, that's proper. For everything I've done for you. And you're worshiping me? It's, it's, that seems like the proper response. I'll show you. New King James Version, it says it a little bit different. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. But I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you know you're spiritual if you call people brethren, <laughs> by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. But what do you do for the women on that one? Is it cistern? Because that just doesn't seem like that goes. Anyways, I, my own 
thoughts. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Now check this out. Which is your reasonable? Just think about this. Think about all the things you've done for God in your life. Think about all the money you've given, the time you've served. Think about the prayer you've given, the worship you've given. Think about all of this. And he says it's reasonable. I'm going to tell you this. I've walked through some stuff in my life where, I don't know, I expected God to say more than it's reasonable. I expect him, like, you know, if there's, like, a kingdom of heaven, like, purple star, <laughs> purple heart, <laughs> like, a ward. Yeah, Lord, I was injured in battle. Like, I need so. And he goes, it's reasonable. Yeah. It's reasonable? Yeah. I remember I was in a, at a conference, leadership conference. Bishop T.D. Jakes was there, and he started talking about all the ups and downs of ministry. And he's talking about, like, people had betrayed him and things that had happened to the church. And I'm like, my goodness, should we, should we do this? And, uh, <laughs> I think I'd be a good real estate agent. I might, I might be transferring. Um, and, and he's just talking about all these things. And he says, but when I look at the scripture and I give myself as a living sacrifice, God looks at me and says, it's reasonable. It's almost offensive, isn't it? To think that God would think our sacrifice and everything we've given and everything we've done and all the years we've served God and all the prayers we've prayed. He says, it's, it's, it's reasonable. It's all about perspective. If we see him as a halfway God or a marginal God or a somewhat powerful God, then he deserves a somewhat powerful sacrifice or a somewhat committed life. But if he really is God, if he really is who he says he is, if he really is this kind, massive, powerful God, then he deserves my church attendance and my living for Jesus is not something I should get a medal for. It's reasonable. Jesus came and he lived a spotless life. He died on a cruel cross. He overcame an unforgiving grave for me and for That's what he did. And we come to church on Sunday for 90 minutes, 80 minutes, 65 minutes, some of you about 58 minutes. You get here in the fourth song, leave before the message is over. It's like 22 minutes. And we think God should be proud of us. And I'm going to tell you, it's not a vending machine that you put in your service and try to receive your miracle. He's God, and he's worthy of your worship, and he's worthy of your life, and he's worthy of this sacrifice that you would make by giving of yourself with joy. And he says, it's, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. Man. Just a couple months ago, we had a long-term friend of ours uh, she went to be with Jesus, and she was in the hospital for days, weeks, and, and uh, she went to be with Jesus, and we did the funeral here at the, at the church, and uh, she was in her 50s, she's healthy, and, and um, so many of you knew her, and, and uh, just woman of God, she went on mission trips with us, and, and uh, she impacted so many people's lives, we have women in our church, young ladies in our church that was mentored by her, and uh, just incredible, and she went to be with Jesus far too soon. And she's married, and her husband's a man of God. And, and we were doing the funeral service here, and, and uh, I was sitting right over here, and he was sitting right over here in the front row, and we are doing the funeral, and, and he wanted to have worship in the funeral. And so they were playing worship music, and, and uh, I was on the front row. I'm going to be super vulnerable with you just for a second. Um, I had, like, some thoughts going through my head like this. I wish this would have, I wish this would have ended different. I just wish it was... It just doesn't seem right. I wish, God, you would have answered my prayers when I went and prayed for her. I wish you would have taken away that sickness. I wish I didn't have to be here today. I I'm just being honest with you. I'm wishing, like, why are we here having to bury this woman of God? Why? The wishes. And I'm there, right there. And I look across, and he's right here, her husband. Is his hands lifted. And tears are streaming down his eyes. And he's worshiping. Honestly, it's a picture I'm going to have a hard time getting out of my mind for a long, long time. Because I was wishing and he was worshiping. In the most broken moment of his life. In the most broken, I mean, just shattered moment of his heart. His hands are lifted. And he's worshiping. Friend. That's worship. Worship is not when Jesus gives you everything you want and you sing a cute song on Sunday. 
Worship is through the ups and the downs. You see him for who he is. And you lay down your life and you say, I'm, I'm going to worship you. And I saw David Coe sit right, stand right there with a resolute face full of faith. And he worshiped God at the funeral of his wife. See, I think we've been sold the bill of goods that said if we would just go to church enough, and read the Bible enough, and our life is just going to be perfect. God's going to answer all our prayers. And then one time life hits us, and then we think God's a failure, or God's a liar. We wished it was this way, and he didn't do it that way. And I'm telling you, friends, we have the wrong perspective. I don't understand why God does what he does and why he doesn't do some of the things that we want him to do. I don't get that, but I do understand he's God. And my resolute posture is a resolute posture of worship. Come hell or high water, come good times or bad, come peace or chaos, come whatever comes my way, I will, we will, as a church, as a city, as the church of Jesus Christ, we will worship. It's reasonable. For everything Jesus did for us, it's reasonable. For everything Jesus saved me from, it's reasonable. For everything Jesus healed me from, my worship, it's reasonable.